This is Join the Dots. So hello everybody. This is day 8 of COP26, 8 of November 2021. Day 7 was a rest day, so we didn't have a posting. And today, having bored myself with my own update, I wanted to check in with Sabina back in the headquarters. Hello, Sabina. Hi, Ed Nice to hear your voice. Also nice to see your face, see. although unfortunately <laughs> others don't get to see that. Oh, thank you. Very kind. So how is it for you from a distance? How much of it have you managed to follow? Well, well, I find from here, trying to stay abreast of things is very hard when you're staying on top of your day job. It's just a cacophony, different headlines. I've tried to pick up on some of the different sort of webcasts and podcasts and articles, but there are just too many outlets and too many voices. It seems exhausting. I know there's a conflict between inclusion and giving all voices, but it is really difficult to stay on top of what the main threads are. I'm not surprised you say that, Sabina, because even from here, I'm very close to the heart of the COP. It feels quite confusing. There's so much happening. There's so many programs in so many different places around Glasgow not just inside COP, but also outside, that it's very hard to keep on top. In fact, I think partly for security reasons as well, especially if there is a sort of high VIP speaker in an event, you're not allowed to share where the event is. So you need to be working on that particular topic to be told what's happening. But I think cacophony is probably what's intended for a COP like this. That's what I'm understanding. So there are basically heads of state. They come in in the first week. They make statements. Then this week is more the ministers trying to add more detail. And all the while, the negotiators, which are representatives of the government, are trying to agree the details of how the pledges and agreements could be put into practice, which is what gets agreed at the end of two weeks. Now, the word on the street is that actually the COP is not going to finish on Friday as planned, but it will last another two, three days. Jill was actually predicting this. She did say it's partly there's a lot to be negotiated in the detail, partly that people maybe like that heroism of staying up several nights trying to craft the words for an agreement to be signed. So there are these people in the middle, the heads of state, the minister, then the negotiators. Then most of the kind of 30,000 people with accreditation from all sectors, lots of different countries. There are lots of experts, but there are also people who represent particular groups. I've heard this morning that there were a lot of industry representation that some people weren't happy with, but there are also lots of NGO representation. There's a stand, a pavilion representing indigenous people. But I also met lots of indigenous people in the march on Saturday saying they didn't get accreditation. So they are here, but they can't go into the blue zone. And blue zone is not only where it happens. There's also a green zone, which is across the Clyde, across the river from the blue zone. And that's where a lot of the think tanks, NGOs, and perhaps even industry sector representation have their stance. I haven't been there yet, but in the next couple of days I will go. So accreditation is mm. party overflow, what you are, invited party yeah. overflow. Is that accreditation? Yes, it still is. So accreditation is basically a badge that allows you to go into what they call the blue zone, so where all the, the negotiators, heads of states, ministers and country and topic pavilions are. Each country gets invites or organizations get invites, like United Nations bodies and European Commission, that kind of organization, not individual companies. And businesses can't go directly. So they get number of invites, they then invite people and you need to fill in a form. In this case, in the year of COVID, you had to say about if you had any vaccinations or if you had had COVID, and then you get vetted, accredited to come in. But depending on your badge, it's different. Talking about COVID, we also have to do tests every day before you go in. They look at your NHS text. 
So what rights and responsibilities does your accreditation convey? What do you hope to achieve being there? We can't even go into the rooms where negotiations happen or the texts are prepared. Um, What we have is a great opportunity to meet people uh, that you wouldn't otherwise meet, whether online or in your own work. I mean, it'll take several hundred thousand miles of travel to meet all the people I met in the last eight days. And probably I would never have met them. So I spoke at lots of side events, some of which I had pre-arranged, some of which is like people saw me in an event, they invited me to another. And I met native voices, I met investors, I met sector specialists, people from different think tanks that I'd never met before. And I've been in this field for, so, you know, 29 years. So it's an opportunity to come together, but it's only for two weeks. It's very intense, very tiring, and I am on the periphery. But it's only two weeks. The work was continuing before COP. It will continue after COP. So I think this is your first COP. Yeah. Was it what you expected? It's more intense than I thought it would be. It's more chaotic. I thought we would have a program of events at least on this Mm -hmm. COP platform but it's very hard to trace what's happening where I mean sometime I've just wandered around and walked into meetings like that meditative circle that I walked into I mean I didn't plan to be there so there's a lot of that other people who are organizing events I think are probably have find it less chaotic because they know exactly what they're doing they've got several events every day I've got one tomorrow for example so I know that hour I will mm-hmm. definitely be doing that and I'll be chairing something some of the general statements perhaps because we are in the in the field you know they repeat what I've known already, I haven't Mm -hmm. learned anything new from that. But it's interesting to hear some of that coming from particular people. So even though they're speaking common sense, those kind of people have not said that those kind of things before. So they're just saying it now. We have to take that as a win. And then there's some of it is disappointing. Of course, you can always get more commitments, more money into adaptation like the day's topic. But, you know, you know me, I'm not a very cynical person. And I, th- I, I think criticism helps and we need to definitely put the pressure on all this stuff. But it's going to end in a few days' time. The COP is going to end. The problem is not going to end. So if we are too cynical for the duration of two weeks, we're not going to have any energy left to carry on afterwards. So that's, that's how I feel. It's interesting what we hear on this end. Everything from this is our last chance to it's just a boondoggle or greenwashing or blah, blah, blah. And yeah, someone's yeah, yeah. famous words. Probably they're all true. But yeah. what are you coming away with? With uh, How do you balance the hope and despair while the clock is ticking? You talk about patience, but it's harder and harder to be patient, isn't it? I think I asked you that question when I first interviewed you for mm-hmm. your own expertise. And right you said back you have to you, be patient. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Um, yes, on the one hand, the urgency is mentioned several times a day, I'm sure, in all conversations. On the other, people ask you questions and you think, oh, my God, I was talking about this 15 years ago. <laughs> and people before me, and that was first time I heard there were other people 15 years ago who'd been talking about it for 15 years. And that does uh, make, gives me despair sometimes. But I, I can't see any other way but be positive to the people who are only just beginning to have this conversation, not to tell them where have you been <laughs> all my lives. But thank you for coming. And, you know, let's work quick, you know. One thing that I've noticed is that some of the people who are new to this kind of discussion of, especially adaptation, actually, because they're a bit more here, obviously, if they're here, they've been talking about cutting carbon emissions for a long time. The, The realization that actually climate change is already happening and it's not just happening in some small island somewhere, which 
absolutely crucial, by the way, that because those people's lives literally depend on what gets done here and beyond. But realization that it's now happening to them as well. That's why we're seeing, I think, more people into this kind of discussion. But the one thing that gives me hope is that having taken very long time to come to this point of saying, oh, we really need to do something, that they're moving very quickly. Not as quickly as most of us would want, but quicker than they moved to get to this point. I think you're right. A few years ago, climate change was something that was happening to people in faraway countries, which we didn't have to look at. Although, I mean, there are islands I visited doing fieldwork in grad school that are no longer habitable in the South yeah. Pacific. So, I mean, the tragedy of having walked on places that are almost gone. But I think right now, there are very few people on the planet that haven't felt some of the fury yeah. of climate change yeah. in the last year or two. So today is Adaptation Day, and you think people are willing to start talking about adaptation yeah. as they see they can't just ostrich yeah. this away. Yeah. So let me tell you a little bit about what was happening. So there were a lot of ministerial conversations about adaptation and from lots of different countries. And there were some pledges as well, like the UK government has pledged more money to £140 million to Africa, £274 million to Resilient Asia programme. African Development Bank directors spoke to put £25 billion more by 2025 to, so that individual countries can take more adaptation actions. But there are huge numbers to, to you and I, but they are very little numbers compared to the, the size of the challenge because adaptation means that you might need to configure your entire way of living, your entire economy. And most of these countries don't have any room to borrow more. Like they don't even have room to borrow for much more basic and immediate needs. So it has to come from countries that have more responsibility to create the problem in the first place. Something that surprised me, actually, how openly many of the politicians that I've heard said in the north, from the north, saying we are responsible for this and we need to pay our responsibility. Until now, I think I was more hearing, oh, we'll give development aid you know, we're nice people, we'll help others who need more, our help. The The discourse is changing to one of they didn't have as much, they didn't do anything to create this problem or not as much as we have. And we not only have to help them with mitigation so they don't repeat the same mistakes, but also start paying for what we caused I think there is that sentiment. With that, it'll be hopefully more money, more more assistance, more understanding, and and also look into ourselves as well. It's not that this disparity, this injustice, is not only international. When I say that, I, I'm not demeaning the importance of international injustice, but even in the UK where we are, the most vulnerable groups, the poorest, the older the young, the ethnic minorities. We've got so much evidence to show that already they have less access to good environment and they don't have the means to be become resilient to a changing climate. So just transition, justice and environment uh, are things that I heard much more in the last eight days than I have done in the previous years, actually, but it's probably because I haven't heard them. So I think it's also important for us to realize that I've learned a lot from this, listening to the different voices. Yes, I've worked in this area all my life, but I don't have all the angles. I don't have all the ideas. And it's not about facts. It's about points of view. Uh, someone made the point about how the the younger people and women's views have hadn't been 
taken into account in in some topic we were discussing in a, in one of the meetings I went to. The chair said, "Oh yes, we must incorporate these people in implementing the policies," and was about to move on, but this young woman, probably about twenty one, twenty two, this young woman said, "No, no." That's not what I meant. What I mean is that these people's views were not taken into account when you made the policy. It's not about implementing. It's about making the decision that you need to hear at that point. And I think that was one of the most effective things I've heard. And I think it's changed, <laughs> changed me. I think that's really inspiring to know that you're going to bring different perspective home. I mean, in a few days, this is all going to be over. The delegates and news crews will leave and we'll be going back to normal, whatever that is. But of course, the fantasy that we can nibble around the edges and maintain business as usual is the fantasy we need to fight against. So without making people feel just despair and giving up, understand that there's going to be a new normal. And how do we do this in the fairest, most equitable and most sustainable way? And that seems to be the thing that you're bringing home, separating some of the hype and spin from the path forward. So what one thought would you like to close with about adaptation in the future and how we're going to engage this broader voice in those decisions? It's not a case that we can have business as usual to continue, just that it'll cost us a little bit more. We need a rethink of the way we live and do business and make policy. But it doesn't have to be doom and gloom. It doesn't have to be on the back foot. It could be that an opportunity to imagine a better world. (laughs) Am I John Lennon? Am I channeling John Lennon? Yes, you are. It is, but it is possible because we can we can live. We know ways to make us live healthier, happier in in cleaner environment. Still make money, still have a pension, but you know. There's no pension in a dead planet, as someone said in another thing. Yes. And uh, however much these things cost, they cost less than the consequences of us yeah. doing nothing. Yes. And so the hard nosed economists can focus on that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, look at you. We can still dream. <laughs> we can still dream. So thank look you very you. much, Ajay. I wish we had a lot more time. I'm really looking forward to doing a deep dive in some of the things that really excited you and the three of us can do that and but it was really nice to see you i was getting a bit lonely we miss you day to day the updates excellent all right everybody lovely lovely to see you thanks for listening all right bye thank you for listening and we'd love to hear from you on instagram twitter and facebook 